And I, I know uh, when I pulled up, uh, um, some people didn't know who I was, and there goes the Ten Commandments. Five of the Ten Commandments just <laughs> <laughs> Those first five was always hard anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, so when they said there's the pandemic, it was, it was, we had the TV on and I was in the bathroom and I was going to shave that morning and they said they're shutting everything down and I thought, why am I going to shave? So I came out and I told Becky, I said, I ain't shaving till this is over. And I ain't shaved or had a haircut, maybe three baths. And it's here it is, June is gonna be July this week. So uh, uh, I'll tell you how my life has changed because of all this. But first I wanna redo our scripture lessons. And uh, I, uh, I picked the uh, Ten Commandments in uh, John 3.16. And I'm gonna uh, read our scriptures and it's uh, in Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You should have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters below. You should not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents, the third, fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father, your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and the smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. Do not have God speak for us, to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. And in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you, if you live by those Ten Commandments and know John 3, 16, you got the battle won. And... Uh, uh, I've, I've got a friend that's a Jehovah's Witness and all. Oh, he was on the phone with me a couple weeks ago and he was telling me about 145,000 people is going to still be here in 2,000 years and, ten, and all these numbers and years and I thought it's not that complicated. You just go by those Ten Commandments in John 3.16 and you don't have to worry about any other stuff. So I decided uh, you know, to grow this beard and the first thing that uh, I found out was that uh, nobody knew me. <laughs> nobody knew me. And being a recovering politician, that ain't a bad thing. <laughs> and especially being Harold Selby, that wasn't a bad thing. So imagine if you could be somebody else. And, and, and so, man, I could go to town <coughs> and nobody knew me. Even former employees of mine, I walked past them, hello, they had no idea who I was. And uh, so, I, I gotta find my notes here. I, uh, I thought, man, this is, this is crazy. So what, what I did was, I started thinking, well, I've got this beard, maybe if I, uh, I wear a different hat it even throw people off even more so uh, this is a hat I always wear this is my fishing hat and I got the same uh, res response that you gave me on the parking lot he said who's that old codger well when I fish now they just think I'm some old codger and they'll actually let me have a good spot 
And, and, and when I'm walking down the boat ramp or something, if we're fishing in a boat, the other guy wave at me like, look at that old guy. He ain't gonna do nothing. But I thought, man, I get even more respect, you know? And uh, uh, one of the, here, here's a hat that I, I, I found has some meaning. Maybe Delmer would know about this. If you got a hat like this and a beard, what do they think? That guy's got a gun. <laughs> that guy has got a gun. And, uh, and so if one, one, one day there was some people parked up at the end of the road and uh, Becky and I drove by and they didn't leave. Well, the neighbor called and said, hey, would you go check out why that car's up there? Well, I put my orange hat on and I drove up. I didn't get 20 feet from them and they took off. So their perception of me was completely different with that old beard and that guy with that hat. Well, uh, you better watch out for that guy. So uh, whenever I'm in a danger zone, I always wear the orange hat. They have a gun. But they don't know that. They say, well, he got that hat on, especially during hunting season. I go to a gas station or something. That's one of the boys there. How'd you do? Oh, you're pretty good, you know. <laughs> that, that always worked. Here's another one. Look at this hat. Now, don't that, don't that look like something? Huh? When I go to the grocery store and pick out a steak, they say, that guy knows what he's doing. He, look at that. And uh, uh, I bought this hat when we had the first rodeo in Pacific. And because uh, I was in charge of it. Well, I didn't know nothing about rodeos. But boy, when I, and I bought the hat at the rodeo. Well, boy, they sure thought I knew something about horses after that. And then the second year we did it, I always got told people, I said, well, this ain't my first rodeo, you know? But uh, it's just a perception, you know? And, uh, oh, when I go to the feed store, I put this John Deere hat on. All right. Now, when yeah. they hear, they say, that guy knows what he's doing. And they even asked me, they said, you want that on the farm account? You know, they never asked me that before. I was just a clean cut guy without a hat. It's a perception that they, you know, in their head they thought, well, and I use it. Here's a hat, and uh, Jack, you'd know about this hat. This is a, this is, this is a kayak and canoeing hat. And this, that's what I wear in a kayak, and uh, Boy, it, it, with the beard, it really looks like I know what I'm doing, doesn't it? Even if I tip over. But it also, uh, 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 was it um, old Brim, Brimley? Uh, Br Brimley, what was his name? Uh, Walter Brimley. Remember him? Yeah. He'd say, one of these days I'm going to climb that mountain, that mule, whole rivers in me. And, and I, can be, I can be Walter Brennan. Walter Brennan, that, that, that's who it was. <laughs> and they don't know who I am, you know? You know, the other thing is when I get off the highway, there's people collecting money. They run to the car and give me money. <laughs> Here's my favorite. And Mike Edmondson, we both got these hats because we got model A's. But this hat... And these sunglasses, they had 50 IQ points to me. <laughs> Look at that. And then, I got a pipe. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. You know, don't I look more intelligent? <laughs> I go to them car shows, don't I? Mind? And we wear, wear our hats, and they think, boy, them boys know something. But the beard, you know, it really set it off. So, that worked. The other thing, and I didn't find this out until uh, just a couple of days ago. I don't do it in public. But remember, Pastor Scott gave us these. Don't I look like that king, the, the Burger King guy with the beard? Don't I look like him? I could go and get a free hamburger, I bet. So all of that, all of that, you know, I was thinking, man, people treat me different. 
it's it's a good thing and all that, but it got me thinking. Uh, if people have a percept, if, if they change a perception of me because of a beard and a hat, what would their perception be if I was brown or black or red? So put yourself into those people's places when they walk in a place the, the, the same way. Um, where I live, the land uh, that, I, that I live on, um, is the, the uh, Trail of Tears runs right through it, right through it. And um, I don't know if you know more too much about the Trail of Tears, but um, I've got a, a, a short thing that I, I pulled up on it. And it's a big deal in St. James because they're gonna, uh, we're trying to get the uh, National Trail of Tears Museum built there. And uh, the Missouri Humanities Council is working on that. And they've actually been to my property. But um, in 1829, President Andrew Jackson called for the removal of tribes in the southeastern United States to lands west of the Mississippi River. The following year, Congress responded by passing the Indian Removal Act, authorizing the president to negotiate with tribes for the removal. Some tribes resisted, the Seminoles went to war, but the Cherokee went to court. In 1832 case, Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Cherokee. However, Jackson chose to proceed with the removal policy regardless of the ruling. The result was a forced mass migration of native peoples that history remembers as the Trail of Tears. The most notorious of those removals was the Cherokee from Georgia. Thousands were disposed and forcibly marched across the country to reservations in Indian country, which is today located in Oklahoma. Many died of exposure, starvation, and diseases along the way. The exact number will probably never be known, but estimates range from 2,000 to 6,000. So there's, um, there's, there's many, uh, uh, diaries and notes at the library in St. James about when they came through there. And uh, the reason is, is uh, the government would pay the local farmers for um, corn or feed to feed these Indians. But they had to walk from Georgia all the way to Oklahoma. Well, they stopped at uh, Merrimack Springs and to read the, uh, uh, the diaries from that time, it was December the 6th, and um, I believe it was like in 18, uh, yeah, it was 1837. It was real cold, and that's when it got cold outside. And they had to sleep on the ground, and a lot of them were sick, uh, but there was a number that died there. And on our property, there's three Indian graves. I don't know if those are the three of the ones that died there or they died before. But the Trail of Tears came right through our property and uh, the uh, uh, the thought of what those people had to go through and basically right through my front yard, uh, thinking about how the pain they had to suffer and everything, uh, it, really, uh, it, it really makes you think uh, uh, about those times because here's the crazy thing is they had those people that made them Indians march to Oklahoma they read the same Bibles we do they they and and one of the uh, diaries I read the lady said because uh, they would have a, a, a doctors and and uh, a, a physician and army uh, personnel that went with these Indians but they didn't they would stay at the local houses and uh, they would stop on Sunday. They wouldn't march on Sunday because it was the Sabbath. They they honored that commandment, but they they didn't care about the other parts. But it was it was uh, bad. And when I and when I'm mowing the grass, I think about those poor Indians they had to walk across there. Well, uh, last week was uh, uh, Juneteenth, and which was the end of slavery. And so to St. James the uh, uh, Merrimack Springs, it's called the James Foundation that runs Merrimack Springs, they uh, put out some history of what was happening there uh, during slavery. 
slavery. And I'm going to read that. It says, in reverence to Juneteenth, Merrimack Spring Park would like to acknowledge and honor the extreme hardships and sacrifices made by people who had no choice in the building and operation of the Merrimack Ironworks. The groundwork for the James lucrative iron business was built on the back of enslaved workers from 1828 until the Civil War. Thomas James and Samuel Massey, those are the owners, continually held 15 to 25 people in slavery, slavery to perform the most grueling task within the iron plantation. They dug the furnace foundation and quarried the stone for building the furnace. Later, they chopped timber, mined iron ore, and quarried flux for the iron smelting process. It's interesting that if you look at all the drawings uh, in the museum there, there's, they're all white folks. <laughs> there's no slaves working. Adults and children alike were rented for $25 to $120, depending on their gender, age, and skill level. Most came from communities such as Columbia, Fayette, and Fulton along the Missouri River. From first-hand accounts, and there's so much uh, uh, data on this where they kept great records. Samuel Massey expected a great deal for the price he paid. The day's work consisted of 10 to 12 hours of hard labor. Slow workers were forced to work well past dark to complete their daily task. The working conditions were so harsh, many enslaved workers escaped and ran back to the people who claimed them as property. Some enslavers refused to return to runaways, claiming the tasks were so punishing they injured the health of the enslaved workers. Next time you visit Merrimack Spring Park, view the immense furnace and walk down the path to the former iron pit and feel the heat of the day upon your shoulders. Imagine working 10 to 12 hours pouring those stone and ore. When telling the history of Merrimack Ironworks, you must give a voice to all, especially those who did not have a choice in being there. So when those slaves escaped, the only, the only way out north was again through my property. So here these slaves have, have, was escaping and going north. They had to come right through the same, in fact, they probably took the same trail that the Indians uh, took and that's why uh, the uh, army used that trail. It was a trail that um, went to the Missouri River. And uh, so, man, I think now I think of, uh, uh, of, of those slaves that um, are part of the history of my property too. Um, it's, it's interesting that they were going one way and the uh, Indians were were headed the other way, and it was, uh, it was that was uh, pretty close to about the same time. And reading the diaries of the Indians that were out there, it's just it's just terrible because the Cherokee were a, 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 a real uh, smart uh, group of Indians, and, and they had lucrative farms and things in Georgia. And that's why the government wanted that. So, with with all that's going on with um, uh, things, I was going to try to tie this together in what's happening today in in America. And uh, Steve Gall, who was a former speaker of the House when I was there, he wrote something yesterday that. Um, he put on Facebook, and I told him, I said, I'm going to use that at church tomorrow because it says what I was wanting to say. And he, here's what he says. It's easier to tear down the past than to build a better future. It's easier to sit motionless and keep your position of perceived superiority than to work toward promise of equality. For building is more work. It takes vision, something better. It takes leadership and patience, faith, and hope and it requires work and dedication to fulfilling that dream. We cannot change the past, but we can learn from it and make the knowledge change, the, the knowledgeable change for the future. Only by working together will we find the best path to success. Only by understanding our neighbors can we find our shared vision and work together to attain it. And I thought that really said what, what I wanted to say. And one of the things is, uh, on equality, if you're for equality, and it doesn't matter if you got a beard or what kind of hat you got on, 
or what color your skin is, then we're in the right church because United Church of Christ has been fighting for you uh, for equality for decades upon decades upon decades. And uh, uh, it's nothing new to the UCC. And if you ever go to the, the St. Louis Council meetings or if, if you've ever been to an annual meeting, you, you learn that really quick. In a few days, the USA is going to be 244 years old. And we have fixed many things uh, that were right in the past, and we'll continue to build a more perfect union. And like Steve Gall said, only by understanding our neighbors can we find our shared vision and work together to attain it. And I think that's why on that commandment, that last commandment, God said, love your neighbor. And he knew. I mean, every one of them. There's a reason for it there, and I've talked about that with the stack of law books that I can stack that high, that all go back to those Ten Commandments. All the laws had to be made because people were breaking them. And that neighbor one is, and, and that might be the hardest one there, because, boy, sometimes people just don't like their neighbors. Let us pray, Lord, we pray you give us the wisdom and the faith to make it through these difficult times for our country. While we may all look different, we have in common that we're, we were created by you. Instill us with leadership, patience, faith, and hope. Amen.